Amen. Holy, holy, holy. God is separate. He is the Creator. is separate from His creation in His essence. And He's the only one in His category. And He has the right and He has the power and He has the authority to tell us what it is that He wants us to to do as his people while we live on this earth. And that's what our passage today is about. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. We will be thinking today about how we are to understand where we fit, what is our place, what is our role in the body of Christ. Both in the sense of honoring our Savior and our Lord uh, in a universal sense of the body of Christ, but even more tangibly and more specifically, how that looks in this local congregation and how that plays in. And it turns out it is crucial for us to understand God's design, and He is gracious to, to explain that to us. Our thinking about these things are very, that's very important, very important. So, Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. And so that we see the, the, the connection of our thinking to these verses, I want to read uh, verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 12, and I'll begin in verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world or age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Father, I come to you now, and I pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds to the truth of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Now I want to ask you, which of your five senses do you consider expendable? Taste? Smell, touch, sight, hearing. Which one of those do you consider expendable? Which one of those do you place little value upon? Of course, we consider none of the senses nor the parts of our bodies used to experience the senses to be expendable. In addition, we value balance, for example, helped by our little toes, and grasping aided by our opposable thumbs. And everything else we do, we value those things that are facilitated by different body parts. In Romans 12, 4, and 5, Paul used the human body as an example to help us understand the reality of both the unity or oneness of all those in Christ and the diversity, particularly as it relates to the function of all those in Christ according to his design. This is seen in a local assembly of believers. In the verses that follow, Paul gives instruction for the use of God-given spiritual gifts in the building up of the body of Christ. But the prerequisite for seeing this happen, for applying this, for understanding what needs to happen in the use and the employ of the spiritual gifts is to understand your relationship as a believer to all the others who are in Christ. This is what Paul is majoring on. He runs through a list in the verses that follows of some gifts as examples. But before that, prior to that, 
prerequisite to that, fundamental to the successful accomplishment of that, is that we think correctly. And thinking is very important in this passage that I read today. We must think correctly. And this is just a, this is a function or a description of our worldview, how we orient ourselves to the world, how we orient ourselves, how we see ourselves to God and to His creatures. How we think of ourselves in relation to other believers. So, he gives us the analogy of the body, the uni unity and diversity in the human body, and then he talks about the spiritual reality of unity and diversity in the body of Christ. And that's what we want to see here from these two verses. First, let's look at the analogy. In verse five, uh, four, four rather, in verse 4, he says, For as in one body, and this is helpful to understand, we've got an analogy because he says, as, and he's pointing us, he's going to tell us, I want to help you see something, especially, and as, as, you're, as we learn to study scripture, when we see this pattern, the verse 4, this, this sentence is, as something, in verse 5, look at the first word there, so. So he's giving us an analogy, as this is the case, so this greater thing needs to be understood. So that's a, that needs to be understood as, as a way to interpret Scripture. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Now he doesn't go into detail explaining that because we, we understand that. That's one of the reasons this works great as an, an analogy, because we're dealing with something we're familiar with. Maybe we don't think about it a lot. God's great and wonderful design of the human body is it, it doesn't require a lot of effort on our part to function <laughs> for the human body to function. But what we're pointed to are two factors. First of all, the unity of the body, and secondly, the diversity of the members. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, the passage we read moments ago, we get examples, eyes and ears and the, the senses, uh, hearing and smell. But here, what, what he simply references is one body, many members. But let's think about that just for a moment. <clears throat> so we see that Paul is starting with this analogy, and he's applying it to believers. Well, here are a couple of things that Charles, Hod Charles Hodges said uh, in his commentary to point us to this, the, the benefit of this analogy. He said, The union of the several members of the body is a result of their being all animated and actuated by one soul. The body is many as to its members, but one in the or their organic connection. Now let's think about that. I have two hands, but I don't have two me's. It's just me. It's just me. I have two hands, I have ten fingers, if we can count the thumbs as fingers, but I don't have ten me's. There is a unity that that's how I live, and that's how everybody in the world lives, despite great diversity. Now, if we got into the biological sciences, we could go a lot farther than I just did with those examples. There are amazingly intricate systems and have different functions. I understand some of the basics. I do not understand uh, the details. I understand that God has supplied oxygen in the atmosphere and made me so that I can get that oxygen when I breathe and because of the, the uh, cardiovascular system have the benefit of that oxygen spread throughout me, my, my body. Again, I don't know the details, but there are different systems at work in the body that are very intricate, very detailed, very specific. But I don't have a sense of, of diversity of me's. I have a sense of just me. It's just me. That's the way I think of my body. It's me, and I consider every part of my body to be important. Now, you might say, yeah, but we all know that there are some 
parts more important than others? Well, consider the care that you show for the members of your body that would probably, would probably be considered less important. I would say that if we're answering a question on a test, we would say, you know, which is more important, your brain or your little toe? Brain. But think about how in practice, if you were giving a lecture as to the reasons that the brain is more important than your little toe, and while giving it, an anvil fell on your little toe, would you note that? Would that matter? You, would, you are not able to separate, even if you think, <laughs> well, I just, you know, my little toe is not near as important as brain, but you know what? You care about your little toe. <laughs> you care. I've seen on TV shows, I've never seen a person ever, no matter which body part it is, if there's some bad guy and there, or there's some threat to the, the health and well-being of that body part, if it's a little toe, a finger, or whatever, if that part is threatened, I've never seen anybody go, oh, that's just my little finger, it's no big deal. I can do without that. I've never seen that, never heard of that. So we might, we might think, well, yeah, there's parts of the body that are very insignificant, but there's just one me and every me considers every part of the body to be important. That's the way it is. That's how we act. That's not what we say or think. That's just how we act. We protect every body part, every member of me. See, the point is that it is your little toe. And you are a unity, even though you are made up of many parts. So when you start to think of it, the point here is that there is, that yes, there's diversity, but it's the unity uh, that, is, that needs to be considered and that is crucial. So there's one body, but there's many members with diversity of function. The parts of your body make up the whole one body. Your body has different parts and systems, do different things, and you like all of them. You like all of them. As we read, now let me just remind you again what, what we read here. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Think about how ridiculous that is. If the eye begins to think, what I do is way more important than what that part does. The eye might see something, that, that is needed, but without a hand, just can't get it. Just can't, no way to get it. That's what Paul is saying. The eye can't do it. The head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. Because the head might consider a great place to go and then realize, I can't get there. We can't walk with our heads, or at least I've, not aware of that ability in anybody I've ever seen. This, these are indispensable parts. These are valuable parts, and they play different roles. And how wonderful it is that Paul, in that 1 Corinthians passage, points out on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. Listen, Paul is definitely moving into his idea of the body of Christ as he's, as he's talking about these things. And yet the design of the human body is described accurately here. No division of the body is the purpose. The unity of you is the design of God's design for the human body. And he has designed it well. And so it is a perfect analogy. But now let's look at the spiritual reality of unity and diversity in the body of Christ. What lesson is it that Paul wants us to learn from the analogy of the human body? And the analogy is... As in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, 
so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. I don't have to convince you to value the well-being of your little toe. But it is a product of sin in our lives that we need instruction that we value every single person that is a part of the body of Christ. Sinful flesh will tend to rank and make a hierarchy of importance and value and then attempt to climb up that, that ranking uh, to exalt self. But what we're finding out here is that it is not self that determines this. It is God. God is the one who puts the members into the body as he sees fit. This is crucial thinking. If a church, if a local congregation, a local church misses this, there will be strife, there will be problems. We do not need everyone to be either the feet or everyone to be either the eyes or everyone to be either the ears and so forth. We need all of that. We need all of that. So let's think about the unity. Spiritual and essential unity in Christ. That is the basis of our unities. It's spiritual and it is essential. And we must see this phrase and how important it is. So we, though many are, one body in Christ. One body in Christ. The fact that everyone in Christ is there due to the grace of God in regeneration, that is, that everyone in Christ is a justified, forgiven sinner, means that everyone in Christ has that very membership in the body of Christ in common. In common. On football teams, there are scholarship players and there are walk-ons. And the difference is the scholarship players were those who were so good that the coaches, the team says, look, this guy's good. And they say, if you'll come play for us, we'll provide you with a scholarship. You don't have to pay for anything. We'll just, we're glad you're here. And then the walk-ons are the guys that think, I ought to be on the team, but they didn't offer me a scholarship, and I'm just going to join the team and try to stay on the team. In the body of Christ, there are no scholarship players and there are no walk-ons. There are simply those who God, in His mercy, has drafted, has gone out and, and, and by His grace, brought to Himself. None of us can say, I'm here because God saw in me the valuable contributions I could make and He wanted me on His team. None of us. None of us. Every one of us is here by the grace of God. Every one of us who is saved is saved by the grace of God. Every one of us deserves the lake of fire. Every one of us on our own. But in Christ, we are redeemed and we have that in common. And I, I understand the temptation to say, okay, of course. I really don't think we can do that. I really don't think we can act like, well, we've nailed this. We know this. What, let's get into something deeper. Let's, let's, let's do some theology. Listen, there's a reason why this is the issue after the... Well, there's a doxology because of the, the doctrine, the truth, the mercies of God are so incredible. Paul had to break out in praise. There's a reason that what comes next is this. This. This is not... Peripheral. How you relate your, how you view your relationship to others in the body of Christ will determine how effective you are in the body of Christ. You must understand your spiritual and essential unity with all who are in Christ. We are related to the head of the body, and we're all related to the head of the body in the same way. And I want to show you a couple things here. 
in the book of John. So turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 16. We want to see how important unity is to the Lord Jesus. He is the head of the body, right? We're all agreed. We're not, we don't have a controversy over that. Jesus is the head of the body. John chapter 10, verse 16. Let's go back to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. You remember what we, what we read over in 1 Corinthians? So that there may be no division in the body. That's unity, right? This is spiritual and essential unity. And it is inherent to being saved because there's only one way of salvation. Everybody that's saved is saved in the same way by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And this is what Jesus is saying. The other sheep, most certainly, as he is speaking to his Jewish uh, disciples and a Jewish audience, refer to the mystery that the Gentiles are also fellow heirs, members of the same body, grafted in. And I praise the Lord for that. But the result is one flock, one shepherd. We don't have a Messiah for one group and another Messiah for another. It's Jesus. Jesus. He is the one who came, according to Isaiah, to restore the house of Israel and Judah and to be a light to the nations that God's salvation might extend to the ends of the earth for His glory. One flock, one shepherd. Look what else Jesus said about unity in John 17. John 17. Jesus explained it. There will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus prayed for it in John 17. Look at verse 11. Jesus praying. This is God the Son praying to God the Father. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Look again, verse 21. Let's start in verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Uh, that is a reference to us sitting in the room in the book of John. You believe because you heard the gospel, right? The gospel as given, starting with the apostles and entrusted to faithful men who would teach others also through the centuries. We heard the gospel through their word, we believe there's Jesus praying for us. And what does he pray for us? That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in, I in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one. Even as we are one. I in them and you in me. That they may be become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So on the immediate eve of his crucifixion, four times we have Jesus praying that they may be one, that they may all be one, that they may be one, that they may become perfectly one. Four times he articulated that. Now let me ask you this. Do you think Jesus' prayer life is effective? I think it is. So let's just think for a moment before we get too concerned about how much damage rebellious and reckless and unthinking believers can do. There is going to come a day when there's going to be the assembly of the firstborn. When the word church as a called out assembly is going to be perfect and there will be a literal, tangible assembly. We can read about it in Revelation. But around the throne and praise and worship is going on. So, don't be worried that we're going to mess up 
uh, so much that Jesus' prayer goes unanswered through all eternity. No, no, no. He's going to accomplish it. But the issue is, if this is his desire, if this is his prayer, and, and by the way, he's not primarily referring to that eventually right there. Because the setting is the disciples still in the world. And so that the world might believe and that the world might know. We ought to pursue the desires of our King with everything that we are. We ought to pursue that with, with everything that we are. What kind of unity is he talking about? He's talking about the way. What is the pattern for this? Even as we are one. That's what he said to the Father. So as the Father, God the Father and God the Son are one, in the same way he's praying that we would be one. That's the pattern. So there's difference in personality, personhood. The Father is not the Son. And yet there is an essential unity of, of, um, between them and among the Trinity. That is the pattern for unity because we are in Christ. We are in Christ. He has died our death. He has conquered the penalty for our sins. He has conquered death and, and been raised to life so that we also can walk in newness of life. We're in Him. It's more than we're with Him. We're in Him. And He is in perfect unity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Which is why it's, it's not only appropriate, but impossible for it to be in any other way that, that we, as we move toward eternity, are more and more united. When we're one day going to experience perfect unity when the sinful flesh is eradicated and there's no more influence from that. But right now, we can pursue this. We can set our minds on this. We can think this way. That's what we've been told, right? Pursue this. Celebrate this. The transformation that comes about in regeneration, particularly the renewal of our minds, our thinking. We have to be on purpose about this. You will not accidentally demonstrate the level of unity with your fellow believers that God wants you to do, to demonstrate. If we just float downstream and let the flesh guide, we will jockey for position with one another. That's what we will do. That's why this is crucial right at the beginning. How we think about this. We're a new church. We do not have the benefit of what I experienced um, last month when I visited Randolph Baptist Church, the church where I grew up, and I saw some people, and I can tell you some family names like Bearfield, McGregor, Tudor, Waldrop. And I can look at those people and know this is the generation that's here now, but other generations with that, those same names have worshipped together in this church. We, don't, we can't just fall back on that, can we? We can't just go, well, that's the bare fields. I know them. We have to be on purpose to, to say, and so does Randolph Baptist Church. But what I'm saying is we must think correctly. The Lord has a role for me to play, and I need to be playing that role according to His will. And I need to view everybody else in here and everybody else in the body of Christ as my brother, my sinner. And it matters to me what happens to them. It matters. That's why we take accountability for one another. So many people, we've, it's, it, is a, it is a terrible, terrible uh, blight and a terrible, terrible hindrance to the church that we th have a negative view of church discipline, of its purpose. We ought to never want to see any church discipline. But discipline in itself is not negative. It provides order and it points to good. And it is the way that we help one another. I mean, we care. We care. If we care for our own physical bodies, we have to care for the body of Christ. It matters what happens. Galatians 3.28 talks about our spiritual unity, even saying it goes beyond all distinctions like male and female. 
and yet I can still distinguish. I'm, uh, I'm married to hope and one of the non-negotiables for a wife for me was that she be female. We are one in Christ, but we have that distinction. <laughs> That's really on purpose, and I'm glad that it continues even as we're both in Christ. Jews, Greeks, slave, free, there, all these real, tangible distinctions, it is possible to have a, a, an essential and spiritual unity that should be the primary the primary driver of how I think of other people. We must value every brother and sister in Christ as fellow members of the body of Christ, and we are members in the same body. The body of Christ transcends all physical divisions by which humans are divided. The diversity of those in the body of Christ glorifies God. See Revelation 5, 9 for this diversity. And let me just read that to you. Let me tell you what's going on in Revelation 5, 9. Uh, beginning in uh, verse 9, they sang a new song saying, this is worship to God, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, that's worship to the Lamb, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom. How many kingdoms? One. And priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth so from every tribe and language and people and nation, that four words to, to emphasize the diversity, right? And yet, they're all in Christ. They're all redeemed by the Lamb. There is unity there. There is unity there. So that's cosmic. But don't miss the opportunity of that's provided by membership in this local church to demonstrate the value that you have for every fellow member in the body of Christ. Honor them. We're going to read that in the verses coming up. Serve them. We're going to read that in the verses coming up. Love them. We're going to read that in the verses coming up. Lord willing, in the, in the weeks to come. One body in Christ. In Christ. You know, this is a characteristic axiomatic phrase and an axiom just means it's it's self-evident it's a it's a defining tr truth or phrase it's an it becomes uh, normative it's the normal way uh, to think about this in Christ is used by Paul more than 150 times in Paul's letters there's different counts uh, in different sources but it's a lot <laughs> Though Paul has different reference when he employs the phrase, in other words, that he, he may be talking about different aspects of salvation, but he's always talking about salvation in Christ. And it essentially locates salvation with all the details of salvation in one place only, in Christ. Why do we preach that Jesus is the only way of salvation? Because all the things that we need, all the benefits of salvation are found only in Christ. That's why Paul used that phrase over and over, in Christ, in Christ. And he relates and attempts to motivate us and help us to understand the, the, the need for unity with this phrase, one body in Christ. He just states it. So we are one body in Christ. Though many, though many. So there's diversity of function. There's spiritual and essential unity in Christ, and yet diversity of function. See, we need to understand the difference between unity and uniformity. We are not called to uniformity. Around the throne of God, it does not look like uh, pictures that, that I've seen of the, uh, in, in movies and in documentaries, say the, uh, or just put it this way, like an army. From a distance, when an army is standing, uh, presenting, uh, the soldiers are all presenting themselves, you can't really tell much difference. It just looks like almost there's clones. There's just, and that's the idea in the army. Everybody's going to respond the same way to the same stimuli. We're going to break down the diversity and get it functioning like that. Look, God doesn't have to do that. He, he is the author of the diversity. That doesn't mean that there's different truths, different ways that we can love God. No, there's one. But the diversity of function, the diversity of who we are, 
glorifies God. It's God's plan and God's grace that place the members of the body of Christ into the places of service that He desires. It's not based upon merit, but upon God's plan and purpose. So do not elevate yourself in pride and conceit over your function in the body of Christ. It is not your doing. Here's a way to say that. By preaching a sermon today, I have not moved myself a millimeter closer to gaining God's favor on just who I am without Christ. As a matter of fact, the prophet Isaiah has characterized all our righteousnesses as filthy rags. If that, when, when we begin to do that, when we begin to think, well, I'm more important than that person because what I do is more important than what they do, what we're doing is trying to, to com- compare piles of filthy rags before God. My pile of filthy rags is more impressive than your pile of filthy, filthy rags. How ridiculous that is. How pathetic. Let's call that what Paul did, a pile of refuse and, and no Christ. Now, let me show you something that we, we got to hear in Twin Falls that is crucial, and I, th- I think related very much to this. You need to be in the role that God has assigned to you. That's what you need to do. You need to be in the place you're supposed to be. Where God wants you, that's where you need to be. And not some other place that you think that you might prefer, or not failing to be there because you think, well, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not able to do this. There's no reason. If God wants you there, you just be there and He will take it from there. You be there. You be willing. You be available. You be ready to serve and He will take it from there. But I want to show you what happens when you're not where you're supposed to be. Look at Jude. The book of Jude. Or listen, if you'd rather. These, this is a description of certain people who have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. They're described in verse 12 as hidden reefs. We got to hear Richard Owen Roberts preach on Jude, and he said a couple of things that just really made me look here. Now, you might have a translation that says blemishes. The word could be translated either way, but given the fact that there's five characteristics of these people and they all have to do with natural uh, dangers, hidden reefs, or some translations say uncharted reefs, let me, let, me, uh, let me show you. At your love feasts. See that? It says in verse 12, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts. This is located in the fellowship of a local church, our local churches. They are hidden reefs. They are uncharted reefs. Now, do you know what the benefit of charted reefs are? Do you know what, that there is some benefit to reefs under the water? They create harbors and give protection from strong waves. And the water is more calm and it's useful and helpful. There's safety when you're dealing with charted reefs. But you know what uncharted reefs can do? They can tear the ship up if it runs into them, right? And nobody knows where they are. By definition, they're hidden. They don't know where they are. When we decide, I'm going to play the role I want, in the body of Christ. We are acting like this and we are off the chart of what God has designed us to do and we begin to function not like a, a reef that is charted that can be understood. Everybody knows where that is and that means there's harbor and stability and safety because we all know where we are. We're supposed to be. We're supposed to be there. But we can make ships wreck when we're uncharted reefs. When we say, no, I'll, I'll be where I want to be. I'm not following God's chart. 
Look at the last of that little section in uh, verse 13. Wandering stars. Wandering stars. Think about the difference between a wandering star and a fixed star. By a fixed star, you can navigate. You can get direction and, and comfort and have a sense of purpose in where you're going. But by a wandering star, there is no possibility to get any help of direction. So this is false teachers. These are people who crept in unnoticed, and they're, but they're at the love feast. They're, they're in, is Judah's warning. And as I read this, that we're to be thinking, how we're to think, that we're to think individually members of one another, I don't have the right to think. What do I prefer at church? What do I like at church? What do I want at church? Um, how do I need it to be at church? I don't have the right to act like it's all about me. I don't have the right to do that. That would be like me saying, I care about my eyes, but I will take no action to maintain any of the rest of my body. That will not work. That will not work. And my eyes will suffer. Do you know that? If you don't take care of every part, your whole body will suffer. That's the way it is. That's why the analogy is so perfect and good. You need to see yourself in relation to your brothers and sisters as fellow members in one body of Christ. And it matters. It matters how you think. We're going to be studying the different possibilities of how God might use people. It is not wrong. It is not wrong to pursue excellence in serving God. It is not wrong to, to want to be ambitious toward accomplishing your role in the church. It is not wrong for me to want to understand well the passage that I'm preaching with in all the intricate details and to, and to work hard to try to, to communicate it well. That is not wrong. That's pleasing to God. But it is wrong if I were to say how valuable I am in the kingdom of God. They ought to say this to me, or they ought to treat me this, or they ought not to do that. Or they. It goes back to what we read in verse 3. We ought to think accurately and sensibly about ourselves. And that means we're all here by grace. We're located where we are, put into the place of service according to God's plan. So the question is, will you serve according to God's plan and will you value all of the other servants of God who are serving according to God's plan, whether they have an international ministry or whether nobody's ever heard of them? Because the Lord said a lot of things like, the first shall be last and the last will be first. I think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of crowns given to people from around the world that we've never heard of. But God's heard of them. So, as you consider how you fit in here, be relentless. Be relentless in your love for the other members of this body and make sure that what you're doing is to glorify God and to love them. Now, it is... The grace of God that has placed us here. And if you're here today and you say, not only do I not understand what my role is in the church, I don't even know if, I'm, if I am, I don't know who I am. It's the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus paying the sin debt for you. You need to understand that. You need to come to Christ. And if you need to know more about that, please talk to me or, or someone here and we will talk to you about that. Before those of us who are in Christ, let us View our role in this way. Think this way about how we fit and what role we play, what member we are of the body. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us, I pray. Be with us. Be honored and glorified in this body. Lord, point out in our hearts pride and arrogance and conceit the desire to be preeminent, 
anything that's going on like that. Lord, bring conviction. Show us so that we might confess that to you, repent of it, and live for you and your glory and for the good of your body. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.